Well, hello again. I'm excited to come again this week with a message from about 20 years ago. Uh, this, this message has been at my website for a long time. Uh, if you want to print out a copy so you can kind of go along with it uh, with me together, you go to the homepage, garycarpenter.org, on the right-hand side at the top, uh, there's, where there's a list. And the first list on the right is called articles and if you click on that you come to a page and there's a section called from formula to relationship and this is we're several lessons down into it but you'll see this one today which is how God prospers believers now even though I wrote this and posted it at the website probably almost 20 years ago now I read it very carefully I have for several days gone through it to see if it needed to be updated in the sense of, is, you know, is there something wrong, something that needs to be changed? And I couldn't find a thing. And see, that's, <laughs> I'm relieved when that happens. That'll get me wrong. My thinking has undergone major change over the past 20 years. But many of the foundational things, you know, truth is just truth. And it doesn't change with time. Uh, even though uh, there's a big push in America, well, really all over the world today, trying to make you think that truth is relative. No, it's not. <laughs> you want to know the definition of truth? Jesus says, I am the truth. <laughs> but he also was the manifestation of the Father. And he's also called the Word. And that's why he said in John 17, Father, thy Word is truth. Well, Jesus is the Word made flesh. And he is the truth. Okay, that's a whole different message. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> Today we're going to look at how God prospers believers. And I'm going to read some. And I'm sorry I have to look down when I do that. I've, I've added a light where I don't have to look down as far. <laughs> but then I'm going, to, I'm going to be really open. In fact, let's just pray. Let's just open up in prayer. Father, I just thank you for the, the, the guidance, the leadership of your Holy Spirit. And Father, I thank you for the truth that you've revealed in your word and that you've made available uh, for us to, to uh, receive, to live, and to enjoy. And Father, uh, all of us, we want to hear from you. It really doesn't matter that they hear from Gary at all. We all want to hear from you and hear from the truth. Father, I am open to you, the voice, the leadership of your Holy Spirit. And my, you know, my plan is to go through this teaching today, but I don't care if we finish today or if it, if it takes three, three weeks. I don't care. Lord, that's up to you. So I am just really open to your to visions, uh, dream or visions or, or insights any way that you want to lead. I will not if you if you bring something up, I will not ignore it because I know it's good for all of us. And. Father, thank you for feeding us from your table by your Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, now I'm looking forward to it myself. So, <laughs> All right. How God prospers believers. We are all pretty or fairly familiar with the Lord's plan for providing for the needs of those in full-time ministry. And you can tell that from the Old Testament as well as the New uh, both in the Old Covenant and the New, full-time ministers for the Lord are primarily primarily supported by the offerings, the free will offerings, let me say, of the people. Now, just a couple of scriptures from the New Testament concerning this are, here's the first one, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Even so the Lord, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Well, the type in the shadow, you can go back to the Old Testament. We've already taught this, especially if you've heard the series that I taught on the book of Malachi. Uh, one of the reasons for the tithes and the offerings being set up under that system was so that the full-time ministers, in that day it was the priests and the Levites, they were to live off of the tithes and the offerings. In fact, the, the uh, Levites... When the land was distributed to the, to the tribes, the tribe of Levi did not receive any land. They didn't have any acreage like big massive farms or anything where they could grow crops or herd cattle or that type of thing. Why not? God wanted full, he wanted them full time 
in the ministry. He, I often think about Pastor Dave Roberson and, and how thankful I was. You know, thank God for that he had a staff around him. Tim Stemple was really the uh, right-hand man to Pastor Dave Roberson all those years. And, and uh, Tim handled the staff and he they handled the email and the letters and the phone calls and the writing of the books and the publications and all of those things so that, thank God, Dave could give his time to the Word of God, prayer, worship, and fasting. Well, thank God for that. I, I mean, I would have so, you know, and, and thank God for the people that supported and still do support the ministry, of, you know, Dave Roberson Ministries, the Family Prayer Center here in Tulsa. And to me, it's, it's still the mothership, you know. But I would have hated it to ever find Pastor Dave <laughs> Where the finances would have to get so bad, we'd find him down, you know, as a clerk at the local Quick Trip or uh, what's in your area, at Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that. Those are all fine occupations. But I would have hated for Dave to have to, to, to take a job like that just, just to pay the bills. I, I mean, it's not wrong for ministers to work. We have that type and shadow in the, in the New Testament. Uh, if there's a reason for it, because even the Apostle Paul, he, he refused to take offerings at certain churches because he needed to make a distinction between himself and the false apostles. These false apostles were even, they were claiming Paul wasn't really an apostle like they were because look, this man makes tents. He, 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 he's not even full time. But Paul was doing that on purpose, at, no doubt at the instruction of God, to show the people a difference. Look, those those guys are after your money. I am just after you. <laughs> I'm here because God sent me here, and I'm after you for the kingdom of God. Those guys are after your money and your. They want your the fame and the prestige and the honor of men. I'm not after that, and you can tell I'm not after that. I'm not even receiving any offerings from you. I'm here for the pure work of the gospel. So what I'm saying is. You're going to see here in a little bit some instructions that the Lord gave Sue and I, and there was a reason for that. It's because of his calling for us in the ministry. God is not a cookie cutter God. He doesn't just bam, 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 stamp out cookies all exactly the same. He is very personal. He is your Lord. He is your Lord individually. Now, there is universal truth. Adultery is wrong always, for example. Stealing is wrong always, for example. But when it comes to your calling and how he's going to provide for you, you've got to walk with the Lord on that. Okay, I just want to make a point that 1 Corinthians 9, 14 again, even so, the Lord, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Well, the Apostle Paul is the one that the Lord wrote that through. But the Apostle Paul himself, there were times when he would take a job. And I'm just saying there's a reason for it. The point is... It's not exactly like it was in the Old Testament where the priests, especially the Levites, were not allowed to have land, okay? You are, in the New Covenant, you are allowed. You, you can work a job if you want to. It depends on what God says to you, and we'll get to that more in a minute. All right, the second verse I wanted to read here is uh, about the, you know, the full-time, God's, His main plan for full-time ministers is to live off of the offerings that come into the ministry. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, let the elders that rule be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. I've had people, you know, you can read everybody's books, everybody's opinion. <laughs> they, they, I've, heard, I've heard them say that that first part of that verse there, verse 17, does not, is not talking about money. Let, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. See, that's just talking about honor. No, leave it in the context. Leave it like, like you know, Pastor Dave would teach us. It means what it means in the context God gave it. Leave it in the context. Well, what's the context here? Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. That's provision that the ox, he's working. It's The picture is so perfect. He's working in the field, just like a full-time ministry is out 
in or minister is out working in the field, whatever his calling is. He's doing what God called him to do. And he is supposed to eat from what grows in the field. Hello, you're the field. <laughs> you're God's garden. You're God's husbandry, the Bible says. <laughs> so, so you don't muzzle the ox. It's okay for us to eat from what's available in the field. Hello, field. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. God understands that. God, in, in fact, God not, he didn't just understand it. He initiated that. <laughs> okay. Now, right on the other hand, we've all, that one of the main things that Pastor Dave taught us is, and, and that I've done my, my best to teach, listen, the Lord is your personal Lord. He has a path for you. You, he doesn't intend for us to just be cookie cutter Christians. Well, I'm going to do this because so and so did this. See, we learned that from Isaac sowed in famine. I hope you heard those two lessons. Isaac, when when famine came again to the land, well, Isaac was going to go down to Egypt. Why? Well, that's what his father Abraham had done, and God had blessed him there. And Abraham came back a very rich man in cattle and silver and gold. So what would you think? You know, well, that's what my dad did. Famine, go to Egypt. I'm gonna, we got famine, I'm gonna go to Egypt. But see, the Lord had a different plan for Isaac's life. Oh, you gotta get this. <laughs> you gotta get this. He is your individual Lord now. And he stopped, he stopped Isaac. He said, no, I don't want you going to Egypt. <laughs> my father went to Egypt? <laughs> I don't want you going to Egypt. I want you to stay right here. In famine, stay right here. And I will bless you here. And boy, did he ever. And you need to hear those two lessons. But the point for today is, you got to hear God for yourself now. You got to hear God for yourself. Man, okay. See, so here come the, one of those little teaching visions, and I'm not going to ignore it. I told him I wouldn't. There's an old story, uh, and it's, you know, it's very common. You know, women, from the time they're little girls, they start planning their wedding. <laughs> I think maybe around the age of four. I, I, I don't know. But, oh, I want my wedding to be like this, and I want my wedding to be like that. And so finally the day comes, and, and they, they, everything is perfect, and everything is laid out just right. And, and uh, the, the wedding went perfectly, just like the bride wanted, and, and, and everyone wore the right colors, and the, the weather was perfect. It was one of those perfect weddings. And they had a, a meal afterwards, a lot of weddings, sometimes they'll have a meal. And this one was, was had a, she had hired a chef even and cooks, you know. And, oh, the meal was fabulous. Trouble of it is, they served steak when she had specifically asked for them to serve fish. But it was wonderful, don't get me wrong. The meal, the chef was wonderful. But after it was all over and the chef, uh, she, she talked to the chef. He said, oh, he said, did you, everybody really raved about the meal. Did you, did you like the meal? And she said, yes. Yes. Oh, it was, it was prepared perfectly. It was delicious. I didn't hear a single complaint. Everybody loved the fish. She said, I just have one question for you. Oh, what is that? Why didn't you prepare the meal that I asked you to prepare? In other words, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? Man, I do not want to hear that on the day when I stand before the Lord, and neither do you. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear, you heard, you heard my leadership by the Holy Spirit, and you followed it. Well done, Gary. Well done. You want to hear that same thing, except not Gary. <laughs> well done, thou good and faithful servant. You need to hear the Lord. All right, so now when the Lord called Sue and I into full-time ministry, he gave us some very unusual and very specific instructions. Now, the, before I even read this, I tell everybody, he doesn't tell everybody this. He, every bride doesn't tell the chef to cook fish. <laughs> you gotta find out what the Lord is telling you. Anyway, I'm, I'll just read it. I mean, it. To me, it was so clear. I don't know that it was audible but uh, I wonder if somebody had been in the room with me if they would have heard this because it was just that clear. I could still quote it virtually from memory today after all these years. But he said, 
take up no offerings from these people. I didn't say I couldn't receive them. He said I wasn't to take up offerings from these people. Now in those days, <laughs> these are, this was way before the day of uh, MP3s, and this was even before the day of CDs. If you, how scary is that for you youngsters? <laughs> he says. So when he says tapes, he's talking about cassette tapes. Take up no offerings from these people. Sell no tapes. Mail everything freely. Do not even put in a return envelope. Never let a human being know of any needs that you have. I am your source. If you will precisely obey these instructions of mine, I will speak to the hearts of the people I choose to support both you and the needs of the ministry. See that, and, and he, let me just tell you now, some 20 years later, he has done exactly that. But at the time, it does not look like he was doing that. <laughs> I gotta tell you, money, money was staying away in great abundance. And we were juggling the, the bills, you know, you know, this month you pay the electric bill and, and hope they don't shut the gas off. And next month you pay the gas bill and hope they don't shut the electric off. And we never did have any utility. I used to, in those days, we were doing these Bible studies here at our home. And, and uh, we'd have so many people here. And boy, the Bible studies went great. People got saved. People got healed. People got filled with the Holy Ghost. It was wonderful. And they were excited to come and we were excited to have them. And on the inside, I would preach, man. We weren't allowed to tell anybody nothing. I mean, we we dressed good, looked good, shaved, you know, hair hair combed, house looked good and clean and everything. Right on the other hand, <laughs> on the and I preached like we had a million dollars in the bank. I mean, I just preached like we had didn't have a need at all. Why? Because that's what he told me. He told me, don't let them know. Don't you know you can let people know without telling them. You can, <laughs> you know, make things look. Like they, they, when they walk in, they go, these people might have needs. <laughs> anyway, we did our best for that not to happen. And, uh, but anyway, I preached like I had a million dollars in the bank, you know, on the inside. While I'm teaching on the inside, Gary's going, oh God, oh God, please don't let them shut off the electricity till everybody's gone. Because <laughs> we were probably late on our electric bill, you know. My credit rating was terrible in those days. But now. I gotta gotta mention this. I'm I'm seeing Jimmy Miller's face, and I love Jimmy Miller. I haven't seen him in a few years. In 2003, the Lord had now we were uh, we were really traveling during those years. That's the years we were traveling to many states in a, in the USA to preach, and we were up into Canada even uh, <clears throat> during the, those years. We went to Europe, we went to Africa, we went to. Uh, South Korea many times and then we had invitations all over the world it was just more than we could do but uh, there was lots and lots of traveling ministry and I would I would of course people would hear me they'd either read this what I just read to you where the God told us don't take up any offerings don't let people know of any needs you have but I would tell them even when I'd preach it and I'm saying it again now listen don't do that just because that's what God told us what I want you to do, or what I'm asking you to do, is seek the Lord for yourself. These, all of these lessons that Dave has taught us and that I've tried to teach as well, and others like Alan and Bronk, uh, Flint and Jim, Martin, the goal is for you to hear the voice of the Lord yourself. Don't do this, what he told me, just because that's what he told me. See, so I saw Jimmy Miller's face. So anyhow, we went to Poland that year and. And Jimmy Miller at the time was a missionary, if you will, uh, I guess that was the word you would use for uh, uh, in Poland. He was trying to establish this gospel. And uh, anyway, they lived in a decent house and drove a decent car, but we were there for a couple of weeks. And as time went along, it finally came out. They were just right on the verge of bankruptcy financially. The ministry, the finances were terrible. And as Jimmy began to open up to me a little bit, he just told me, he says, well, you know, I heard what you, what you taught. <laughs> so I decided I'm not going to let anybody know what the needs of the ministry are. And I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm going to, I, in other words, he basically followed that instruction. I said, 
Jimmy, did you hear me tell the part about don't do that? <laughs> that you're supposed to hear the Lord for yourself. I said, Jimmy, listen, I'm in America. I'm, I'm, I'm traveling to amongst these churches in America, which has got lots of abundance. There's plenty of opportunity for God to speak to the hearts of the people to help us. You know, there's so many people. It doesn't take a whole lot from each one to help, and we're fine. Jimmy, nobody in America even knows you're here. <laughs> And these people in Poland, the prosperity is not the same here as it is there. They can't really help you. They're barely surviving themselves. I said, listen, there are lots of people in America that would help you if they even knew you were over here. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know what God's told you. They have no, they, would, they wouldn't know your address. <laughs> and how does, so I, I got him convinced. I said, listen, don't, just don't promise them things that aren't true. Don't be telling them God's going to make them a millionaire or, I heard a minister recently on TV, I mean, in 2023, sad to say, uh, big name, if I told you, you'd know who it was. It, it, they, he's, they've gone beyond the hundredfold return now. He was actually telling you, if you give every dollar you give, God's going to give you a thousandfold return. People, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's just pure heresy. I'm sorry, it is. And that guy, I don't, not against anybody, but truth is truth and untruth is not truth <laughs> and that is not true that is just not true so i said don't be promising people like if you give into our ministry god's going to heal your body don't be telling stuff like that you know but do let them know what god's called you to do and and tell them how they can help if they want to and leave the rest of it up to god Thank God he listened. We, uh, I helped him even. We made up some flyers and letters and things, and and uh, the thing, the thing turned around. Well, and they finished their work there and came back to America. And God's got him on another assignment now. Just this week, Pastor Bronk Flint, in his Wednesday night message, this uh, well, it's about have been by the time you see this, it might be two weeks ago, but he mentioned the same thing that in the early days he had heard this very, he had heard me read that same paragraph there and so they had started pastoring a little church down in uh, uh, Immokalee. Now Immokalee, Florida is not like Naples. It's not like Fort Myers where lots of wealthy people live. You can have a little bitty church in Naples or Fort Myers and get along just fine. <laughs> All you really need is one good donor and there's a lot of wealthy people there. Immokalee is not like that. It's like 30 miles inland uh, it's it's right in the middle of the orange groves and the to, where they grow tomatoes and watermelons and and that's where the pickers live. That's where the the what do you call them uh, migrant uh, the you know they they're seasonal. They, the the workers come into town when it's harvest time and then they move on somewhere else when it's harvest time there. And Mockley is not a wealthy town, not at all like uh, Naples or Fort Myers or other area, Miami even other areas. But Bronk, Pastor Bronk, he so admired what, I guess, what was in how the Lord instructed us, even though I tell people, don't do that. <laughs> don't do what he told us. Do what he tells you. He, he, had, he had fallen into that same thing. And I, the needs of the church <laughs> and the needs personally were really bad. They were going through about a lot of the same stuff Sue and I were. Uh, hoping the electric wouldn't be shut off, paying, paying the gas bill this month and the electric bill the next month. And so he called me one day and he thought he was going to get a big rebuke. And the question he wanted to ask me, is it okay if I just let our people know that we're in some dire straits financially? And he knew that the Lord had told me not to do that. He's calling me asking, and he was so nice. I still remember the call and, you know, him hawed all <laughs> for it. It finally came around to it. But basically, I can't remember the exact words, but is it okay if I let if I let the people know, that's, that was the ultimate question, however he phrased it. And immediately I saw a picture on the inside and I saw his people coming to church, happy and expecting to have a great service, but they get there and they find out there's a note on the door that the, that the ministry has been closed down due to lack of finances, that the utilities have turned off and the building's been, uh, that the mortgage has been foreclosed on and and I, I, I saw their faces just quickly. You know, those little images that come quick when you're ministering. And they were like so disappointed. 
But there was a little twinge of anger almost like, why didn't they tell us? They never told us. I said, how would your people feel if they came and the church had to shut down due to finances and you never told them? You never gave them an opportunity. They, they, just, they, they, they never had the opportunity to even help. And boy, that, that did it. Hit, that hit right home. He understood then. I said, Bronk, and I basically said the same thing I said to Jimmy. I said, for, it's really for all of us. Just, you just don't promise people things that aren't true. Don't tell, don't twist the word. And, you know, like try and motivate the people to give by telling them things that are not true. But it's fine to let them know what, what you're doing. And it, if, if it's a church, now Jimmy's situation was different because nobody even knew he was there. But I said, your people, this is, you know, a church is a family. And when one part of the family hurts, the whole family hurts. And if they knew, just, just let them know the situation. You don't have to give them great detail. But let them know and then leave it up to God. Leave it up to God and to them. Let God speak to their hearts and they can respond or not respond. We'll see what happens. Well, it turned around. And again, see, and, and that was, and now today, I trust Bronk to hear God better than I hear God. I mean, dear Lord, he, the Lord, I mean, that's almost provoked me to the point of jealousy. How, <laughs> how Bronk Flint hears God and prophesies and, and uh, what we call the blueprint has come through Bronk and many subsequent prophecies since then. It's amazing to me how Bronk hears the Lord today. But we're all in the early days struggling how to do this. Well, thank God. Thank God. I want to tell you again, please. I'm trying to teach and give examples, and I don't have any life to give from, really, except my own, and maybe a few from Smith Wigglesworth or something. But, but you know, and other, what I mean, other people that I know. But when it comes to my own testimony, you know, they overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. I don't love my life so much that I won't be transparent with you because my failures, to be honest, are just as helpful as any victories. You, you don't have to learn from your own failures. Learn from mine, okay? <laughs> I'm transparent all the time, telling you how, how I've missed it and paid the price and how the Lord rescued me anyway. So, do I need, I think I need to read that again. Okay, now, again, after all that, this is the instruction that the Lord gave us. I'm going to read it one more time because I want our mind going down that path for the next for the next paragraph. So here's what the Lord told me. This was instruction to Gary and Sue for us personally. Take up no offerings from these people. Sell no tapes. Mail everything freely and do not even put in a return envelope. Now, let me see like right there. Dave Roberson at the time was putting in return envelopes with his letters and it was fine. Alan Taylor, uh, so many, all of these, it's, it's fine to put in a return envelope if people want to give. See, and I'm not against that. And the Lord's not against that. And I'm just, but he told me. <laughs> Again, it's, it's just wrong for me to do it. Oh, I'm telling you, over the, was I ever tempted? Oh, my Lord, in those early days when money was staying away in great abundance. Listen, I know how to, I'm a pretty good wordsmith. You know, I can put, I can put together a letter where I ask for money without asking for money. <laughs> I know how to do that, and and I could have put in, and I could have diso just flat disobeyed and put in a return envelope. And, well, life would have been quite different because you know it's only by obedience do you retain the anointing, and and uh, so I'm glad that we didn't do that. But was I tempted? Oh, oh, so many times. But the point is, it's not wrong to put in a return envelope. It's only wrong if he tells you not to do it. <laughs> so okay. I am going to read this. Take up no offerings from these people. Sell no tapes. Mail everything freely and do not even put in a return envelope. Never let a human being know of any needs that you have. I am your source. If you will precisely obey these instructions of mine, I will speak to the hearts of the people, the hearts of the people that I choose to support both you and the needs of the ministry. Continuing on with the lesson, we did precisely as he instructed us, and true to his word, he began to speak to the hearts of the people to send free will offerings. It's hard to describe 
the gratitude that was in our hearts as we began receiving this, these financial gifts from the precious people who had heard his voice and obeyed. See, a lot of times people would think, oh, I didn't hear his voice. Yeah, you did. I need to send that. I need to send that Gary. And so I need to send them. I met this one little lady from New York. I wanted to send it back to her. And uh, she began sending $5 a month. And at the time, she was older than I am now. She was about 80, I think. And and when I found that out, I said, oh, dear Lord, you know, I'm supposed to be supporting the widows. <laughs> and I contacted her, you know, and and because I, I felt kind of bad, this, this 80 some odd year old lady sending $5 a month, you know, and I, I contacted her and oh, she was the sweetest, sweetest thing. She said, oh, oh, no, no, it is my joy. It is my, I can't do a whole lot physically anymore, but I, your, the teachings that the Lord gives to you is they've just so blessed my life. This is the only way I can, I can do anything. So, okay. So until she passed on to glory, we, we received her $5 a month. I'm telling you that will humble you. That will humble you. Okay. <clears throat> so it's hard to describe the gratitude that we started feeling. Now, in the beginning, it was not a flood. I'll tell you, it was a trickle. And it, for a long time, it was a trickle. <laughs> and when I say uh, money was staying away in great abundance, even after the people, some of them began to give, it was still years, years went by, uh, testing years, I'll say it that way. And you know, again, I, I see that lesson rising up in me. Uh, again, I'm not going to ignore anything he brings. I have I have a lesson that I used to teach more often than I do now called back to zero again. See, the, one of the reasons that he gave me personally, me and, or Sue and I personally, that instruction, it's because of our calling. We had to learn that he is our source. And I mean, because of the calling that we have to teach in the body of Christ. That's why he wanted it so severe on us. Because even after things started getting a little better, you know, and we had actually paid the gas and the electric and the telephone bill. <laughs> and there was a chicken in the refrigerator and there was some gas in the car. <laughs> and I remember, you know, one time we had like about $50 in the bank, you know, whoa. It's like, okay, I got, I got one nostril above water here. Oh, praise God. Ah, all the bills are paid. We've got some food. We've got some gas, gasoline uh, in the car and we've got $50 in the bank. <laughs> See, just the slightest little thing in those early days, me starting to, oh, I don't have to, quote, worry. <laughs> we got $50 in the bank. <laughs> as soon as he saw that in my heart, as soon as he saw it, okay, fine, give that $50 to so-and-so. What? <laughs> Back to zero again. And that happened several times over the first several years. I, I, I didn't know he was going to go this direction or I would have looked back at uh, the dollar amounts because we're talking many years ago and I don't remember the exact amount, but I think it was roughly $3,000 that we had gotten up to. Now that's, ooh, we're in tall cotton now. <laughs> we had about $3,000, I think, in the bank and man, you know, we're, I feel like Wall Street himself. <laughs> walking down the street here, $3,000, you know. Sure enough, something in my heart began to shift, apparently, and not, quote, worry, because why? Well, I got $3,000 in the bank, not God is my provider. See, that that's where your no worry comes from. God is my provider. And it doesn't matter if you got zero in the bank or 3000 in the bank or 300000 in the bank. God is your provider. That's where he wanted me to be. Any time that I would not worry because we had some abundance, it seemed like he just, I don't remember how many times, more than, more than two or three, there's several times. All right, just give that to so-and-so. And I still remember that day. And it was an urgent one. I said, okay, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I will do it. He said, no, I mean today. Now that particular time, we, I knew who to give it to. It was not a, another minister. It was a family. I didn't know they had any problem at all. Uh, and I don't remember the exact dollar amount, but I, I remember the Lord let us keep $10 in the account just to keep it open. Everything but $10 left. 
And now that a long time ago, I think you might have to have more than that now. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know. But anyway, then you had to have $10 in there. And all the rest of it, I said, and so I told him the number, and it wasn't an even number, like 3,000. It might have been like, I'm, I'm just picking, but it's something like 3,218, maybe 3,218, something like that. I said, does that number mean anything to you? And his eyes went like me, looked at his wife, and you could tell there was recognition in her too. And he said, that is the exact amount we need. We have to pay that by four o'clock today or we're going to lose our house. I, I think that was the situation or maybe it, but it was something really, or maybe it was a tax lien. I, it's been two, 20 some odd years and I don't remember the details, sorry. But, but they had to have it by four o'clock today. And it was about one or two o'clock when this conversation is having or something serious. Man, we got busy, we went to the bank and we got the money transferred. They made the payment, everything was done at, before the deadline that day. But Sue and I were back to zero again and grateful. When I saw that he was working both ends, that he not only was working trust in our heart toward him, but working to deliver a miracle to some other sheep of his that's trusting God for a financial miracle. And we, he got to use us. See, he worked both ends of the thing perfectly, teaching us to trust in God alone, helping them with a need that they'd been asking for. God, it's amazing when you follow his plan. It's just amazing. I hit my knee, sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. All right, so let me read this paragraph. I can obviously, we're not gonna get through this whole lesson today. <laughs> but we did precisely as he instructed us. And true to his word, he began to speak to the hearts of the people to send free will offerings. It is hard to describe the gratitude that was in our hearts, I'm telling you. As we began receiving these financial gifts, from the precious people who had heard his voice and obeyed. My, well, our heart longed to see them prosper abundantly. Man, I wanted everybody who ever gave, I wanted to see them prosper, so did Sue. I had heard all of the popular teaching <laughs> that prevails in the body of Christ today. And uh, it's still on today, sadly, 20 some odd years later. But the prosper the popular teaching about how God prospers believers. And then and now, if you go to Christian TV most of the time, in a nutshell, they all boil down to the same formula. Quote, one way, no matter what, what specific way they teach it, this is the overall truth, so-called truth that they're teaching. The more you give to God, the more he prospers you. Now, the Lord told me that if I wanted to understand how he really prospers believers, that I should study the book of Philippians. And I began reading the entire book of Philippians over and over and over again while praying softly in other tongues. See, I have learned that most error, most yeah, false doctrine in the body of Christ comes from lifting a verse out of its context and then making a doctrine out of it. My favorite example that I'm hearing again right now. You, these are both verses in the Bible. If you lift them out of their context and put them together, you're in trouble. Here's the, here are the two verses. Judas hung himself. Another verse. Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Pretty sure that's false doctrine. <laughs> are they scripture? Absolutely. You can look them up for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. You lift them out of their setting and then put them together. You could, it, listen, they do that all the time, not just with finances, but uh, many other things, okay? Dave was so right. He said, the word of God is like a painting. Every image, every verse in, 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 is a stroke of the brush. Man, if you never heard Dave teach on assimilation and meditation, imagery and delivery, all those are still at his website. DaveRoberson.org, they will change your life. I used to do a, well, anyway, let me finish with Dave. So he'd say every verse is like a stroke of the brush. and But you need all of them together before you'll see what the whole image is. You can't be leaving it out. So based, here's what I started to say. Based on that, I used to teach a lesson called the eyelash of a cow. <laughs> I was trying to illustrate this lesson of meditating the word in whole images. So 
the eyelash. Let's say I carried the eyelash of a cow. I just put it in my wallet and I had it with me all the time. And, and let's say God sent me to some remote island that had never seen a cow. They had, they don't, it, there's no internet there. This is remote people. There's no nothing, no electricity. And they have other animals. You know, they have pigs and other things, but no cows. And they'd never, ever seen a cow. And I'm telling them, well, you, well I, want to, I want to describe to you. I want to show you a cow. Oh, great. We've, we've heard of them, but we've never seen one. And I take my wallet out and I take that eyelash and I say, here, just meditate on this eyelash. And you, you, from that, you should be able to understand what a cow looks like. <laughs> well, that's impossible. You have no idea. Is it really part of a cow? Yes, it is. Is it really the eyelash of a cow? Yes, it is. But can you, can you determine the image from a single stroke of the brush? <laughs> you cannot. And it's not okay to take a stroke from that painting and a stroke from that painting and a stroke from that painting, try and put them together and make that to be truth. But that's what happens all the time when you start lifting verses out of context. It's like trying to understand what a cow looks like by looking at an eyelash. That will never work. Okay. <laughs> See, you, if you've never heard Pastor Dave's teaching on assimilation, where you just read all of the books. Do it, start with the New Testament. You don't have to do them in sequence like first Matthew, then Mark, then Luke. No, no. Re read each book 30 times. Some say 50 times. I don't know how many times now. But read the whole book. And he says, when you're doing that, and we continue here with the lesson, I'm really just quoting what Dave said. See, when, you're, when you read the whole book again and again and again, you are equipping your spirit for day and night meditation. And the best course of action is always to find the beginning of a subject and the end of a subject and put the entire passage in your spirit. When you're dealing with small, small books like the book of Philippians, it's best to simply read the entire book over and over and over to make sure you have equipped your spirit here I said the raw material of the word, which is true, but today I would probably say with the whole image. You are equipping your spirit with the whole image, the whole book of Philippians. There's an image there. Same with Ephesians, same with every book of the Bible. Sometimes there's multiple image, but there's an overall image too. But it's best to simply read the entire book over and over and over again to make sure you have equipped your spirit with the raw material of the word which the Holy Spirit will then use to teach you the truth contained in it. See, that's why Pastor Dave and I finally learned how to do it. It was hard at first. See, it took me a while to learn how to do this. Pastor Dave kept saying, learn how to read the Bible and at the same time pray softly in other tongues. When I first started trying to do that, I was praying too loud. and My own voice seemed like it was interfering with what I was trying to read. And I was not making any progress, but I learned to, re when, especially in those years when I was assimilating the New Testament. And what I mean by that is read every book 30 times, keep, keep a record of, how, you know, record of it some way. I have a form available if you want it called the assimilation form. It's at the printed materials section of the website, but you can keep track of it. And your first goal is to read every book in the New Testament 30 times. Now, if you'll do that, and what I learned to do was while I'm reading that book again, pray softly in other tongues. And Dave says, listen, what's happening there? You're, you're inputting raw truth. You're inputting the Word of God into you. And at the same time, you're allowing the Holy Spirit to pray the understanding of that Word, to teach the understanding of that Word to your spirit. So you're meditating the Word, reading the Word, and you're praying the mysteries contained in it at the same time. He said, throw in a little fasting now, and you've added the supercharger. <laughs> That's exactly what I learned to do. And it took a while to become comfortable with it. Now I can hardly open my Bible just automatically. I'll start praying softly in other tongues. And it's, oh, it's a great tool. Anyway, and if you haven't heard Pastor Dave's uh, series on assimilation, you don't have anything else to do. <laughs> you need to hear that. DaveRoberson.org. While you're there, send an offering to him. <laughs>
telling you, still the mothership. So in my reading and meditating, in the, or 20 years ago, the book of Philippi, over and over and over again, I found out that the believers at Philippi were just, they were normal Christians who spent the majority of their time with the daily affairs of life. They had children to raise, uh, occupations, jobs to do. Uh, uh, they're just normal people like, like today. And when, fought, when Paul first preached the gospel to them, he described their condition as being in deep poverty. Yet these same believers, once they had learned of the grace of God concerning their finances, eventually became Paul's, in fact, they were the first ones to become Paul's financial supporters for his life in the ministry. He said that their deep poverty eventually abounded to the riches of their liberality. Now, let me show you the verse, it's the passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. <laughs> I must admit, it was a while before I realized that the Macedonians Paul is referring to here and in 2 Corinthians, were actually these same churches that started at Philippi. Now see, this is the advantage of reading the book repeatedly over and over again many times. On one of my journeys through the book of Philippians, this next verse just kind of jumped out at me. It's Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, now get this, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, when I saw the word Macedonia in that verse, I could not help but wonder if these were the same people that Paul had written about in 2 Corinthians. I asked the Holy Spirit to give me another witness if this were truly the case, and he brought to my mind this verse. Acts 16, verse 12. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of what? Macedonia, the Macedonians. And we were in that city abiding certain days. Now I was getting somewhere because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that these people went from deep poverty to abounding in their liberality. That's what I've been looking for. <laughs> how does God prosper believers? To find out how God takes a group of people, bestows His grace upon them, and then prospers them. That's what I wanted to find out. Now notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 that we already read, Paul says the grace of God was the key factor in causing their financial turnaround. My excitement continued to build as I went back to the further meditation of the book of Philippians. The answer to how God did this had to be in there somewhere. <laughs> I knew it had to be in there. How do you go from that? When I understood the deep poverty part, I didn't understand the liberality part and, and the grace that gets you there. So as I continued, excuse me, as I continued to meditate the book of Philippians and pray, it seemed that the Holy Spirit kept drawing my attention to a couple of verses that did not seem to make a whole lot of sense to me. Every time I'd read these two verses, it seemed, and I'm talking about in the King James, and I love the King James, but every time I'd read these verses, there was a, like the Holy Spirit was giving me a nudge, something in my spirit, an alert, as if there was buried treasure in them that I had never seen. Now in the King James Bible, the verse reads this way. Philippians chapter one, look at verses nine and 10. And this I pray, that your love may abound, yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So our, he wants our love, he wants their love to abound, to increase, more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Okay? I hear the words, what does that mean? <laughs> Whatever it means, the end result is this, that you may approve things 
that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Well, Dave says, listen, when you're first assimilating the books, don't, don't worry so much about definitions. Don't start getting into, Dave would say, your reference books, your woost, your weeks, and your strongs, you know. He said, just assimilate the books first. But he said, now, if there's words in there that you don't know really exactly what they mean, it's fine to look them up. But don't, just don't get lost in the, in the uh, def definitions. You know, that old, that old, <laughs> that old saying, you know, I, I <laughs> you can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> One time I, see, I, sometimes he has me teach in a micro manner. Sometimes he has me teach in a macro manner. Well, what do you mean by that? There's times you got to describe the whole forest. This is a, this, I'm going to describe to you a pine forest and you start describing the colors and the, the height of the trees and things like that. But let me start. Oh, that's macro, the whole forest, see. But sometimes, you know, I like to do micro and I start getting into the Greek definitions and, and then I want to know not only what does the Koinonia Greek say, but what does the classic Greek say and how was it used in their culture? And those are all great things. But he showed me one time, he says, you, you know, you can get so lost, pretty soon you're just looking at the forest, then you focus on one tree. Then you focus on the bark on that tree. Then you lift up the bark and, oh, there's a bug. Then you get the bug and you dissect the bug. <laughs> and he said, didn't you come here to enjoy the forest? <laughs> and there I am dissecting this little bug, you know. <laughs> sometimes you're macro, sometimes you're micro, okay. But after you've assimilated, assimilate them, just read them. It's okay to look up definitions. So let me get back to the lesson. We're going to run out of time here today. So the way this is written, I could not make much practical sense out of the verse. I know he wants our love to abound, but what does it mean the way he said it there in knowledge and in judgment? How does your love increase in knowledge and, and how does that produce judgment? You know, I didn't understand what he was really saying. In a, see, I, I like practical things. I like down to earth things. I like... E equal MC squared is great. It's truth. How, do you, how does an engineer, he wants to look at that and go, how do I make a toaster out of that? A better toaster that people could use, you know? Something practical. So the way it's written, I could not make much practical sense of the verse. I was having a hard time understanding what Paul was actually saying to him in a practical way. So I looked up every key word in each of those verses in my Greek dictionary, at the time it was the Strong's is all I had. And I listed them in sequence on a sheet of paper. Now here are the words with the definitions. And I've got to get through this part today. Knowledge is the Greek word epinosis, and it means full knowledge, full knowledge. A greater participation by the knower in the object known, thus more powerfully influencing. Judgment. That's the word. I may not pronounce these right. Aesthesis. And it means perception, discernment. When it, and the word approve in that verse is dokomazo. And it means to appear after testing. It's used speci specifically regarding metals. Coins could be tried by fire, for example, to see if they were precious or not. The word excellent. The Greek word, I mean, the English word excellent comes from, is translated from the Greek word uh, diaphora, and it means to differ. It means the highest and best compared with something else. Okay, sincere mean, is the Greek word, ele, God Lord, elekrines. I have no idea how you sub pronounce that word, but I, I know it, it, I found out what it means. Unalloyed, no mixture. It's pure of unmixed substances. It is single-minded, for example. No mixture. Sincere. Oh, I like that word. And the last one I looked up was offense. And that means to stumble or to cause to stumble. You either stumble yourself or you cause somebody to stumble. After many more hours of meditation and praying in the Spirit, keeping in mind the context of the entire letter, the Lord gave me the following paraphrase of those verses. Now, I am not a Greek scholar. I am not saying that 
that he is saying, what I'm giving you is the heart of the Holy, it's the heart of God. This is what, this is what he was trying to convey to the people. And you can tell from these words, you just string them together, you can tell what he's saying. This is a paraphrase, it's not a translation. I pray that as your love for Jesus increases, you will increasingly come to know him better. You will come to understand what he's doing in the earth and become even more of a participant in his plans, purposes, and pursuits. The mind of Christ himself will come to have an ever increasingly powerful influence in every area of your life. Your greater depth of acquaintance with him will result in more comprehensive discernment regarding what to get involved in and what not. You will be able to test various potential endeavors with the very mind, the thinking, the processes of Christ to determine which of them contain the highest and best potential for accomplishing His plans in the earth. By this process, you will remain sincere, unalloyed, and single-minded in serving Jesus and not mammon. That purity and single-mindedness will both keep you from stumbling into the world's way of thinking, the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, and it will keep others from stumbling also. Now, before I even read this lesson, before I started this teaching, for days I've been reading this entire lesson over and over again, thinking, Lord, it is there anything I need to change? Is there anything that you would add, take away? Only thing I, he said, no. There was, I, I didn't find a single thing to change. And I, I believe he's still happy with that paraphrase. And I'll just tell you this, in the 20 some odd years I've been walking it out, I have found it to be exactly true. There is no substitute for spending time with him. There is no substitute for him always remaining your first love. There is no substitute, just like the, the chef story with the bride. There is no substitute for hearing the bride's instructions and doing what she asked you to do. There is no substitute for hearing Christ's instructions and doing what he's called you to do. We'll continue this next week. Love you so much. Bye-bye for now.